Hello, my name is Mickey, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Distortion Brothers interview. In this series, we will introduce you to some of the exceptional builders and players who are pushing the envelope of craftsmanship and musicality for electric guitar. For the first episode, I'm grateful to be joined by Jason Lawler. He has been making pickups since the late 70s, and since 2000, Lawler Guitars has been setting and improving upon the gold standard for pickups. You should check out the impressive and extensive line of Lawler pickups at www.lawlerguitars.com. Jason is also a musician, a guitar builder, and an author, all of which contribute to his earned standing as an authority on pickup history and innovation. Recently, Distortion Brothers exhibited at a guitar show where Jason participated in a panel discussion of premier pickup builders. The discussion was extremely interesting and it got deeply technical. I've included a link to a video of that panel discussion in this episode's notes. For this interview, I decided to focus on more practical topics in hopes of giving guitar players a better perspective on what is behind crafting exceptional pickups and incorporating them into the guitars we love. Hi, Jason. Thanks so much for being the first interviewed Distortion Brother. Hey, glad to, uh, glad to be there. You work with a lot of boutique guitar builders, and some which have you know very unique aspects to their guitars. Uh, for example, Distortion Brothers carries Taya guitars, and they have all aluminum tops and uh, a, a, a mojo circuit, which is unique to their, uh, uh, to their design. I can imagine that in working with the various builders, it must be a, a process that, that uh, you go through. Uh, tell us a little bit about working with builders. Well, I've been working with builders probably since late 90s, probably, um, before I went full time. And um, it's been an experience uh, to find what they want to have made and how to accomplish that and how to help them figure out exactly what it is that they want or need. Um, for instance, uh, I worked with a lap steel company that's no longer around. They were called Harmos. And I designed all the pickups, specifically the size and the, the shape and the function of it for those guys. Uh, all custom made, all hand cut. Uh, uh, whereas, like Callings, um, they were really very picky about what they got, and they uh, ordered pickups from several different companies and tried out what they liked. They found they liked ours the most, and then six months later, they ordered the same thing from all the companies again. And then they listened to them to see if they sounded like what they got six months previous. And ours were the closest to being exactly the same. And that was one of the reasons they went with us. And there was also a lot of requests um, uh, that we had to fulfill for them. Sometimes we'll actually wine stuff special for a company or we'll pot something a little differently or not pot it. Um, uh, once in a while we'll make something completely custom still. Um, mostly what you're doing is you're finding out what what they're building and then trying to match pickups to what they're doing. Because I've already, like most companies start out, you know, you, you custom wine stuff for specific requests. And I've done that so many thousands of times. I developed a lot of my line due to custom requests, what people wanted. And so I already have stuff made for most requests that you're going to hear. So it's just a matter of matching up different products to different types of guitars and building. I hear that you now have a new partnership with Emerson Custom. Um, I really like their stuff. Uh, a couple of the guitars that we carry, Rock and Roll Relics and Prisma Guitars, use their components within the guitars, and they sound fantastic. We've just recently become a dealer for their pedals, which I'm very excited about. Very high quality, great sound uh, in those. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, partnership between Lawler Guitars and Emerson Custom? 
Yeah, absolutely. We um, used to do pre-wired pick cards for people. Probably we stopped doing it a couple of years ago or three years ago, maybe even four years ago, just because it's not really what we do. You know, we make, we build pickups. Uh, um, and so I was looking for a potentiometer that worked in a, in a way that most people want their pots to function like. And so I tried out all these different companies. And what most people want is they want an even volume drop as you roll through the pot. They don't want it all happening up at the top. Like if you're a guy that does volume swells, you probably want all the action up at the top. But most people want an even uh, uh, function on, on the roll off. And, um, you know, we just happened to, people were saying, oh, I bought uh, a pre-wired assembly from Emerson. And so we checked them out and we had them send uh, some pre-wired stuff. And we looked at the quality of the soldering and it was pretty much exactly the same kind of quality that we, we do. So um, I was really excited about that. And um, so we wound up talking to them and uh, had a few changes to the wiring that we like and uh, uh, they were willing to supply our pre-wired stuff the way exactly how I want it done. And they also sell us uh, loose pots and caps and, and stuff like that. So so we carry, you know, your standard stuff, your Tele, your Strat, your Les Paul, kind of pre-wired stuff. And then we also... Uh, uh, by all of our uh, every kind of you know 500k split shaft 500k solid shaft everything that you would want so if you're going to wire something custom you can still buy through buy through us and it's all their top quality pots talk to me a little bit about what you've done uh to to uh, uh ensure that some a pickup design is consistently produced on day one, day 101, and so on. Yeah. Well, one of the things we do is we have an archive going back many years of pickups, every kind of pickup that we've made, so we can go back and we can actually compare installing a guitar and listen to it, you know, see how it is and um, how it compares to what we're doing now. A lot of it is just keeping track of all, all the specifications, even... Um, even when we when we pot the pickups, we we preheat them to a certain level of temperature. So when we pot them, the wax is going to penetrate all the same amount because it's already preheated. Uh, uh, instead of having a pickup that might be 60 degrees and one that's 90 degrees, and then it goes in the wax, it's going to penetrate differently. And we keep track of, we vacuum it, we keep track of how many seconds, anywhere from five seconds to a minute and 40, depending on what the design is. Um, we keep track of, of course, the wire gauge and the turns and, and uh, typical ohms at a certain uh, air temp that you're going to get. But we also keep track of the Henry's, which is a, a measurement of inductance. And so we, have, we chart all that and we make sure that everything falls within a specific level when we make it. Um, then the other thing that we had to do is we had to start having our own parts made and having uh, most of our parts made, the ones that we have made for us, um, uh, made in the U.S. instead of importing them because um, it's much more consistently made here than it is so if you buy stuff from overseas, a lot of times they will uh, substitute different alloys for what to what's not specified, or they'll they'll substitute different thicknesses of uh, sheet metal for the like the covers. They won't consistently buff or polish it, so you might wind up with thinner covers one time, thicker covers the next, with a different alloy, and all that stuff has an effect on a, a sound. So. Mm -hmm. We started having all of our metal covers and uh, made in the U.S. probably, I don't know how many years ago now, six, seven years ago or something. And we've been making our own screw holes, 
or having them made for us and specified out. And a lot of the stuff we make, all the flat work uh, stuff for like fender pickups, the, the top and the bottom plates, we've been making that ever since I started. Uh, you know, I used to cut them on a, cut the pieces out on the bands uh, and then route them and then drill them with a drill press. Now we have a laser cutter, you know, we've had that for over 10 years probably. So we try to keep everything in-house as much as we can. We even have our uh, coil wire made for us to a specific diameter that's not typical. Really? Yeah, um, because the reason for that is that as the years have gone by, the, the wire companies have been making the diameter smaller per gauge. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not what it was back in the 60s or 50s. And, um, yeah, so we have them make it to a certain range of sizes, whereas if you're just buying stock wire, um, it can vary a lot more because they're making it really the only, the only uh, uh, industrial um, process they use that kind of coil wire for now is like the, it's mostly used by automobile uh factories making solenoids for your starter, that, that sort of thing, you know. So it, the actual guitar pickup industry is pretty small compared to uh, every other type of industry. It's the reason that we uh, took our paint colors and such from, uh, from automobile manufacturers. Right, yeah. How about uh, the, the processes or the, 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 the methods that you've built for designing, you know, real original pickups, um, like the El Rayo. Right. Well, a lot of that stuff is from experience of winding all different types of pickups to different requests, uh, having, um, tried different materials for different things. And, um, for instance, the El Rayos, we were looking for a, a higher output pickup, but we didn't want it all compressed uh, like a, a humbucker would usually get when you, you know, your problem is when you get real high output, um, it becomes a one trick pony where if you try to play dynamically with it, it really doesn't change. It, it's always distorted and it's always at a, at a certain level of output. We wanted something that would, that would vary and we tried different ceramic magnets in it. Uh, we tried different gauge wires, different turns per layer in the coil. And we wound up using, uh, in the bridge pickup, we wound up using an Alnico 8, which is kind of an unusual Alnico magnet, very high magnetism magnet, uh, very similar to a ceramic output, um, but because it's Alnico, it, it affects the inductance differently than ceramic does. And then we wound up using a, a much bigger coil wire like, a, like you'd find in a lap steel, an old lap steel from the 30s or 40s. So the actual DC resistance is low because the coil wire is big, so it has less resistance per turn. Um, so it looks like a low output pickup if you look at the DC resistance, but it's actually not. Uh, and so using those materials, it wound up acting more like a single coil when it you as how it responds to your attack. You can play quietly, and uh, it'll bring it down the volume. And the more you hit it, the more it just keeps giving more juice and more juice. Whereas like a typical humbucker you hit it to a certain level and it'll start to compress and it doesn't really get much louder. It'll distort more, but it doesn't really get louder. Whereas the L rail just keeps giving you more volume as the, the more you hit it. So it, it works a little different. So it, it was just a matter of going through, figure out what we wanted and trying different things to get to where we wanted. So, that's pretty much how, how it's done. And you'll you'll make a pick a version of the pickup 
And then you'll go, okay, well, it needs to do this. And so you try something to make it go that direction. And you just change one variable, and then you'll listen to both of them and see what it did. And if you're going in the right direction, you change another variable, and you just keep going. And sometimes it takes 10, 12 different versions to come up with what you want. Sometimes less. Depends on you built the Lollertron pickup recently, and that it, it uh, has uh, uh, it's such a unique pickup. First off, but secondly, if people have preconceived notions of of what it's supposed to sound like. So, when you went about building that, can you talk a little bit about any challenges you may have had in tooling up for it, or uh, challenges you had in in designing it and getting it just to the way you wanted it? Absolutely. Well, first I had to. By uh, I think it was a '62 uh, country gentleman, so that I would have the guitar and the pickups sitting there, so I could have something to go by. And the beautiful thing about that guitar is it has a, a pad on the back that unsnaps, and you got a hole in the back, and the pickups aren't even soldered; they're uh, like a they have a connection that you screw, so you can pull the whole thing apart, and it doesn't destroy any vintage value or anything. So. I had the pickups, I dropped them into a Telecaster, and I listened to them, and I listened to one of the more popular uh, Filtertron uh, that somebody else makes. And these pickups sounded smoother and less bright and hard than the uh, other ones. So I went, okay, that's what I want to go for. And um, again, it was a matter of I took the pickups apart. I measured the magnets. I figured out what the magnets were, what the uh, what the material was, the size of it. Uh, so I had to draw everything up and uh, uh, started building prototypes. Uh, and the, one of the challenges was I wanted to make it a full size humbucker size. So the uh, Screw poles were just slightly farther apart than a standard uh, filter trunk, maybe a 32nd or a 16th farther apart. And um, I had to draw the pickup cover up. I wanted to draw it so it would look exactly like the original one with the real big rounded corners. I had to draw that up and make it so it had an angle to it on the side so that when I punched it, it would come out of the punch. You know, if it was straight, it wouldn't just fall out of the punch. Then I had to have this company make it, uh, make the tooling. And um, anyways, I wound up working with this company in the U.S. that makes a lot of parts for Gibson. And um, they were willing to make parts for me uh, as long as well, I get a year exclusive use of the parts, and then they get to sell them to other guitar or other pickup makers later on because that's what they really want to do is make parts. So, so you'll see other people making uh, humbucker size filter trons and things like gold foils and Thunderbird bass pickups, everything I've designed that, that they have. Anyways, um, yeah, it was. Uh, having to make new parts for everything, adapting it to a different size, um, and making sure that it sounded like the 62 pickups I had and not sound like what somebody else was making. You also um, have been repairing pickups for a long time. Are there any interesting uh, uh, repair jobs that uh, come to mind? Well, yeah, I've had all kinds of stuff, and still occasionally... There are things I haven't seen yet. I mean, there was, there were so many different designs, especially back early on in the 30s and 40s, that you just don't see people make it anymore. They're just strange things that are uh, not really particularly practical. They're bigger than what people would want to put in a guitar now. Uh, uh, for instance, um, Rickenbacker, back in the 30s, he made an upright base that had a metal tube for a body, uh, one of the earliest ones I made, and the horseshoe magnet, it was a horseshoe magnet pickup. The horseshoe magnet was probably 
nine inches wide and five inches tall. So it's this giant uh, magnetic assembly because they were using a, a, a curved fingerboard like you would find on an actual upright base, which has a huge curve to it. So this thing, the, the pickup bobbin was aluminum. It was probably eight inches long. Uh, I've never seen one since. And uh, I think that one wound up being in the Smithsonian. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. But, yeah, they, they, you just see all kinds of really odd stuff. One time I had a buddy guy sent me, uh, he had a uh, uh, Telecaster Custom, the one with the big, uh, you know, wide-range pickups, because they weren't potted. And, you know, buddy plays with his basement on like 10, you know, so they would just shriek. But I got this, um, I think it was a Corvassier box, uh, a little red box, you know, a couple pickups in it. I just, all I did was pot it for him and sent it back. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if he actually uses that guitar. Everybody knows him as a strap player, but, but yeah, I've had stuff from all kinds of, all kinds of players and, um, all kinds of eras and all kinds of manufacturers. So, Well, not too long ago, you had uh, a very important guitar in the shop for a couple of weeks, and that was uh, James Williamson's guitar that he used on uh, recording the Iggy and the Stooges Raw Power album. And you've made Raw Power pickups. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and about the pickups? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I met... James through uh, a guy that works either at Griffin or the 12th fret in Portland. I can't remember his name, but he made a, a bass for uh, Mike Watt, who was playing in the later Stooges after, you know, Ron died and, you know, that. or maybe he was playing with Ron. I'm not sure. Um, but James Williamson was a, you know, he retired from music and he was doing computer programming or something or write uh, programming or something. And um, he was kind of a fan of uh, Hawaiian music. And um, I think I worked on an old Rickenbacker bake life for him. And then uh, Ron, I think Ron died. Ron Ashton, the original guitar player. And he got a call. Uh, hey, do you want to come? on tour with us, you know, and so he did, and um, he didn't want to take that original guitar that he used on Raw Power on the Road, so he came, I had already done some work for him, he came up to our shop on Vashon, and he dropped off the uh, the Les Paul, it's a, like a, maybe a 73, 74 Les Paul with a sunburst, dropped it off, and uh, left it with me for a couple of weeks and I pulled the pickups out, took them apart, got all the measurements I needed and uh, started doing testing uh, to uh, make copies for him so he could take just copies out on the road. And um, it took, because uh, I had the guitar there, I could directly compare the pickups I was making. So it took a couple of weeks of dinking around and um, made maybe, I don't know, dozen sets for him or something. And he said it was fine. I'd go ahead and he would be happy if I uh, made a raw power set. So, you know, uh, it's amazing that how many younger guys, 20s to mid 30s, uh, that album is like a benchmark for them. That, you know, like, are you experienced was well, for us? It was like you know raw power, and uh, yeah, I, I love the studios. I'm I'm glad I got to do something with them. Thanks again, Jason, for your time and your thoughts. I would highly recommend to any guitar player that they try Lawler pickups and experience their amazing tone firsthand. I've been using Imperials for years and love them. I'd also like to thank you for checking out this interview. Please visit the Distortion Brothers Guitar Shop website at www.distortionbrothers.com for exceptional electric guitars, amps, effects, and more. 
Until the next episode, thanks again for listening. Thank you.